Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gios, for uh, setting the state, the stage um, to discuss development studies through your uh, live uh, changing interventions um, then and even now in your lecture, uh, pointing to uh, synergies uh, between the long durée and the world system, culminating in the very long durée. Um, as you point out, um, this has not only been about you. So at this stage, may I invite members of the panel uh, to take these uh, seats next to um, Dr. Huego and me as co-chairs. So, and, uh, uh, oh, okay, okay, and uh, so, so, so the panelists will present their critical comments in alphabetical order. But, but uh, perhaps um, uh, Professor Don Marshall would go first, as um, he's joining us from uh, Barbados, where it's, as I understand, around around three a.m. Uh, but uh, as as he said earlier. It's all for Professor Gills. So, um, uh, Professor Marshall, over to you. Greetings and thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you very much. I hope I'm in clear voice and that uh, the, re the reception is fine, that the technology allows for uh, for me to be heard and clearly. I, I believe if you raise your thumb or your finger, I would know that uh, everything is going just well. Uh, I'm, I'm just waiting for that waiting for that signal to, to to indicate that everything is going just fine. Okay. Yes. Um, great, fantastic. I want to thank you, Professor Barry Gills, for the wonderful sweep that you took us through, a sweep of memory for me, and some nostalgic, some deeply reflective as you went through your discourse about life in development studies, and you remind us of several lifescapes uh, that Bradell would have, and um, Tolstoy, I think it was, would have uh, uh, influenced you in terms of shaping of this discussion. But I think my task here is to Apart from the comments that you made, I want to also emphasize the the nature of the speaker, the the man. The you heard a bit from him about uh, how he goes about his work, and I just want to speak to that aspect by referring firstly to his soul craft. Uh, Barry Gills is a remains a humanist. A humanist, not only in terms of um, his unrelentless pursuit for justice and, and his honesty, integrity in the pursuit of such, uh, but I think he's very much, very much aware that um, the struggles for a better way uh, do not all lay in a single paradigm, a single theory, and it's something that he has um, been very influential in imparting to many of us who in the mid 1990s were his students, his doctoral students at the Newcastle University, certainly in my own work, uh, coming as it is from the Caribbean, Caribbean life space with different historical and institutional starting points. Um, it was very important that I could see in how I reflect on challenges facing Caribbean development, uh, a perspective, a range of perspectives that recognizes that, you know, when you when you uh, invent a space, a social space on the basis of degeneracy tropes and the ideas of black as degenerate and ideas of the, the Caribbean merely as space for deviant money and deviant bodies and deviant sexualities, etc. Um, 
it's important that if you're going to be thinking about the development um, challenge, that you have a perspective that is going to be sufficiently supple, subtle, nuanced, and um, it's going to capture that, you know, that studying development in the Caribbean development context, in the Caribbean context, must mean you, you have to move beyond uh, certain kinds of narrow paradigms that speaks to growth, uh, growth theory, modernization theory, and the rest of it, because um, the Caribbean is not and has never been, um, as it were, sleeping beauties for Europe to give it a kiss and, and through its policies, uh, at the adoption of its policies, these countries will just experience um, miracle growth. So uh, meeting Barry and meeting colleagues at the time, all questioning modernization theory and by extension questioning dominant the dominant globalization theorem, uh, we could not benefit better than to have someone as a mentor like Barry. The first thing uh, Barry would have said to us is, um, you know, I hope you're very familiar with the idea of globalization as epoch and also the need to look at the knowledge produced about globalization, that is to say the epistemology involved. Uh, I mean, we all came to different kinds of conclusions, but thematically along the lines that globalization amounts to ideology, and that's not the globalization of markets that are of concern really, but the marketing of globalization itself. And also when we were looking at um, the best ways in which to theorize, we also recognize the value of the historical method, the value of reflection, uh, because we thought that we had to reflect um, and historicize. Uh, and, and the reflection is not to be confused with reflexivity of the Anthony Giddens sense, but reflection in terms of, you know, what about those concepts and categories like class, state, etc., that we've come to grow up with for such a long time, are these categories still relevant to how we see and understand the world today? So uh, there, there is, in so many ways, Barry would have influenced our thought and our directions uh, beyond even the, the, the task of completing and thinking through what, how we frame our doctoral studies. Uh, in my own work, for example, I continue to do work that is um, critical. I do a lot of work within the decolonial tradition. Uh, I, I, I marry my own sense of IPE with a sort of post-colonial ways of framing. I am very um, much someone who would question the authority of um, Western structures and institutions in determining uh, uh, what constitutes uh, uh, tax evasion, what constitutes uh, money laundering in our parts, and they question why we, we, we continue to produce these classification systems that exclude London and other venerable spaces of the West that also engage in, the, um, in providing offshore financial services. And um, and then other work I also do look at um, uh, matters to do with um, climate justice matters to do as well with reparatory justice and um, ask some other critical questions there. But from the lecture that we get today, I want to conclude by saying a few things. Um, I don't think it's just about meaning making. Uh, I think when Barry asks us to keep in mind the ways in which our profession involves a degree of competition, professionalization, etc., and never lose sight of what's important, I think it's not necessarily the meaning making that's the problem. It's the it's the the politics of meaning capture, you know, the, 
we're involved in knowledge production, which is about meaning capture. And um, I find myself having to write back to empire in ways that keeps the fire in the belly. So um, uh, I am very much fiercely committed to that. And um, the problem with it is that as you're, you're engaging in that kind of intellectual struggle, um, you know, sometimes you put your life on a hole. And um, I think that is where the, the, the problem comes because your governments are many, and then there, and then also many in the NGO communities are relying on you to produce, um, well, if they see that you've got rhetorical talent, they're relying on you to help them frame um, positions that will uh, remain Western epistemic centers that they don't, they don't have the authority to do certain things. And um, you're drawn into different kinds of, of, of struggle on behalf of the state. And then on the other hand, you are also you also run the risk of of offending state managers by the, just the very way in which you you frame development and you attack the orthodoxy. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I hold Barry up as a mentor and, and someone that I admire, uh, it's not so much to do with him going against the orthodoxy, but in everything that Barry does, he's always against the grain. And I find myself, in terms of my own uh, personality, I, I, I tend to be against the grain a lot. And I draw my inspiration and comfort from knowing that here's someone that I would have met who is also in the struggle for meaning capture. And um, he's won many friends and he's won many critics uh, daring to go against the grain, daring to roost with um, certain ways of framing and seeing. So... I, I draw a lot of um, inspiration from him in in that in that regard, and um, finally, I do believe that what is important to focus on the, the the fact that there are many interacting and converging crises that do confront us. That we are very much that we must also never lose sight of the ground in which we stand, the spaces in which we um, theorize and help to influence policy. It's very difficult sitting here in the Caribbean, recognizing how race overdetermines life chances, and not engage uh, the Fanonian antagonism in relation to the black-white relation, and how racism remains so very endemic endemic in the sense in how um, certain spaces are deemed centers of intrigue and degenerate and other spaces are deemed, um, uh, you know, bellwethers of what should be best practice. And um, the levels of, of epistemic violence that persists layered on top the many, the many actual brutal physical violence that remains an enduring legacy in, in parts of the Caribbean is something that um, uh, we, we come to grips with, we, we try to battle with and so on. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with societies that have not had a long history of intergenerational wealth transfer among the black majority. You're dealing with societies that um, have not had a post-plantation healing you're dealing with societies that the trauma is so inestimable that even as the battle report puts out that reparations should be running in the trillions, we know that that's politically pointless to, to engage in and that we have to find ways to articulate how do we fashion renewal and repair of Caribbean societies and economies uh, in a way that doesn't say we need a paycheck in a way that doesn't say, um, here's a sum total of what we can calculate and estimate. You owe $17 trillion. You know, um, we are caught in the throes of um, a discourse where lawyers and economists are sitting down 
and trying to work out through an understanding of thought and through capitalist understandings of value, what slavery, the slave trade, near genocide of indigenous people and so on, um, costs. And it's repugnant, it's morally repugnant to many progressives in the Caribbean because once you frame um, reparations discourse in that way, you, you sort of, you never drive to the fact that right here and now, the debts that are accumulating by our governments uh, are as a result of them trying to engage in infrastructure makeovers ever since formal independence that um, uh, hits their, their, their uh, capacity to service that debt effectively. So we, we do need interventions of a reparatory kind, but those interventions of a reparatory kind has to be in the direction of renewal and repair in the form of investment in, in projects that could see transformation of societies and economies in order to positively affect life chances of the uh, of those that were affected and uh my final final point in terms of the drift of the conference the, co the theme of the conference and so on and listening to barry i think with development studies the problem is that we need much more moral content in our work we need to our work and our theorizing should reflect much more moral content um we have to ask the questions that um, gender theorists have been posing. We have to ask the questions that Fanon and others have been posing about the question of um, race and overcoming racism. We have to ask the question that um, LGBTQ communities are raising about what does it mean to pursue just inclusive development. And we have to turn development studies into projects of well-being and ecological harmony. Um, you know, the advance of human, the advance in human dignity is something that Caribbean people are instinctively uh, 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 grappling with. And, um, and, and this is part and parcel of who we think, what we think remain essential goals in development studies. I should yield at this point. Thank you. And I think I, I invite um, Professor Jamie Morgan um, to make his observations. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Hello, Barry. It's been a while. I don't have a lot to add. I come from economics and work in a business school. So the place I work for stands for almost everything that most people who are sat in the room with you find contemptible or oppose most of the time. Which doesn't mean I agree with everything that happens in business schools, obviously. But most of the time I spend my time thinking about things in a somewhat different manner than is the case in development studies as pursued by the people in the room. And it, I met Barry about 25 years ago, although he probably doesn't remember when we did meet. He was with Susan Strange at a Beza conference. But the things that have always struck me about Barry is he has generosity of spirit, intellectual curiosity, and lack of ego. Now then, if you were to ask, you know, in some kind of Greek symposium, what makes for the perfect academic, the ideal, it would be those three things. Yes. However, those three things are not what are rewarded in academia. So it, it is truly remarkable that Barry has managed to maintain those three characteristics for this long and to be as successful as he has been and to be as genuinely interesting as he has been. So I have nothing but praise for Barry over the last 20 odd years. At the same time, he said two things during his um, public lecture, whatever we're describing this is that one might find at least the basis of something what you could argue about. Yeah. Now then, in a dialectic, ultimately there is no failure, possibly. 
However, for a species, there is definitely failure. And in the case of our species, failure is extinction. And we're now within the possibility <coughs> that that will be within lifetimes now of people who are alive at the worst case. Yes. So to a certain degree, one might say, well, that's where we really are at the moment. We're acting like we have choices we don't have in a time where we really shouldn't be doing that because things are existential in the matter of that. Yes. So, I mean, that is a definitely an important issue. And the other is, you know, the long durée matters, clearly. We didn't get to where we are without there being a historical process, multiple historical processes, thousands of years of what we want to describe as changes in civilizational process, yes, one kind or another. You can go back to Erida, it's 5,400 BCE. You know, we invent writing, it's 3,200 BCE. You can go to somewhere like, I don't know, Egypt, it's 2,950 BCE, the pharaohs arrive, etc., etc. You know, 79 BCE. AD, rather, you've got something like Pompeii. There is a long history to go through, yes? At the same time, as it did not take the long durée to get us to where we are now. It took the Great Acceleration, and the Great Acceleration is 30 years, and it's 30 years of working against fact, working against scientific consensus, working against the things that we can all understand to be the case in a material process. And a great deal of that is down to, you know, my field, economics at the same time as the political economy of economics and the power of economics and policy in the world to continue to do things based on capitalist processes that should not have been allowed to continue for this long because they were manifestly dangerous and most people who were in a position to make those decisions knew that at the time. And that does not require a long durée. But what it requires right now is some way of persuading people in the wealthy world to do things differently. But the wealthy world is now a divided world based on fundamental inequalities the biggest one being wealth. How do you get the people in the wealthy world to a consensus, to change, to do the things that are required within the next few years and bring them along in something like a cost of living crisis and when everybody's distracted by war? Yes, it's hard to say how the long durée will help us with that in particular. It may, because we can look to history and say, well, how did we deal with these things in the past? You know, because this is not the first kind of situation where our species has faced an extinction event. <clears throat> Early on in the Holocene, there were only a few thousand humans. You, know? you go back to the major civilizations, every single one of them has gone through its own localized extinction event of one kind or another. You know? And various historians argue about those, you know, the 4.2 kill a year event and all of those kind of things. You know? the, the kind of late Bronze Age collapse. The climate events are not new, but this kind of climate event is new. Because this is global in a way which is new, right? and it's anthropogenic in a way which is down to us, obviously, because that is the very nature of anthropogenic, or if we want to call it capitalogenic. So I don't really know where I'm going with this, other than to say there's a great deal of potential here for debate about the nature of these things, which doesn't necessarily go down to our interest in the history of these things. Because, again, in an emergency, you don't spend your time arguing about whose fault everything is. Right? You solve the emergency and then you move on. Yes. In what sense do theories that we have now and the increasing neologisms help us with that actual problem? OK, that's all I have to say. Good to see you, Barry. I think we, we can go with uh, Warden. Warden, Warden, Warden can go. So... And then we go in that order. Share. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, uh, we will proceed with the uh, pre recorded video messages sent by uh, Professors uh, Walden Bellew and Kevin Gray. Uh, Walden Bellew was a recipient of the ISA IP uh, Outstanding Public Scholar Award in 2008 when Barry Gills was uh, was sharing it. Uh, so I think uh, we also have another recipient of the uh, Activist Scholar Award here, uh, Professor David Tavainen. Um, and we, initially, we tried to reach out to uh, Susan George to make a speech uh, and testimonial for Barry. But uh, Susan was the first recipient of the Outstanding Public Scholar Award 
but Susan is already 90 years old. Um, and then the second recipient is Walden Bellio. Um, I reached out to Walden when he was in London uh, because they had this emergency conference uh, on global intellectual of conscience, yeah, with Professor Richard Fax and other. So um, this is a message from Walden Bellio to uh, Barry. Hi, this is uh, Walden Bello, and uh, I'm joining you from Manila. My good friend Barry Gills is uh, headed for a well-deserved uh, retirement. Um, he will, of course, be missed, but um, of course, we will continue to hear from him. Barry. Um, has been one of the outstanding theorists of globalization. And uh, I have learned much from uh, his work. Uh, but um, he has also had several other qualities that are worth bringing out at this point. Um, aside from um, um, being uh, a real uh, very important activist scholar. He has especially worked with um, people from the Global South, both activists as well as uh, academics and with academic activists. And uh, this um, work with um, uh, scholars and activists from the Global South has um, been seen in the many projects, um, both um, uh, political projects as well as um, um, articles and studies that he has co-authored with uh, friends from the Global South. He also has been uh, specially um, engaged in inspiring and helping uh, younger uh, scholars, uh, younger progressive scholars. Uh, I, I think there are many who will testify to the fact, you know, that um, his help, his assistance, and inspiration has, um, you know, been central uh, to their lives as academics and as activists. Um, not only uh, inspiring them intellectually and politically, but actually very good um, 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 friendships with them. Uh, and friendships, uh, of course, are very, very important. Um, our relations are not just intellectual and political. Uh, and Barry has had this uh, very important added dimension of friendship uh, with young scholars, as well as with the rest of us. So as I said, uh, we will continue to hear from Barry uh, because he's not somebody uh, who retires politically. Uh, he might be retiring from uh, academic work at this point in time, but really for academics and activists uh, like all of us, there is really, really no retirement. So congratulations, Barry, as you enter uh, a new stage of your life. And uh, all the best uh, from me and from all of us, uh, uh, your friends in the Global South. Thank you. Thank you, Walden. Um, and now we're going to hear from uh, someone who really works so closely with, uh, with Barry Kills, uh, Professor Kevin Gray from Sussex University. Okay, uh, this is Professor Kevin Gray. Um, it's a real honor to be asked to uh, speak at this event marking Barry's retirement. Uh, I've known Barry for quite some time now. Uh, we met first, I think almost 25 years ago when I was a postgraduate student at the University of Newcastle. 
And as a newly arrived student, I enrolled onto two of um, Barry's uh, master's module. One of them, I remember clearly, was the uh, International Political Economy of East Asia. The other one, um, I'm not sure if I quite remember the title, but it was something along the lines of the state and the international political economy. And I was a student who had um, sort of graduated with an undergraduate degree from quite a, a kind of orthodox and in many ways a typically sort of Eurocentric uh, area studies department. So, you know, coming from that background, um, the thing that really struck me about Barry uh, and made an impression on me was his very strong um, and in many respects unwavering commitment to critical scholarship and um, and I was impressed by how this commitment to critical scholarship was uh, based on a, 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 a normative commitment to uh, global justice. I mean, this this was all new to me at, at the time, uh, at least uh, in a university uh, uh, setting. And more specifically in intellectual terms, um, I think what also made an impression on me was um, Barry's uh, consistent emphasis on the importance of situating contemporary analysis within uh, a much longer historical time frame than was typical and certainly um, uh, compared to what I was uh, uh, used to. Uh, I think most of you will be familiar with, with Barry's uh, co-authored work with Andre Goodner Frank which, which dates the origins of the, the world system back um, 5,000 years rather than the 500 years uh, put forward by uh, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. Um, I, it might be an exaggeration to say that this thesis was then taken up uh, uh, universally amongst scholars, but I think it's certainly um, evidence of uh, Byrie's career long um, tendency and commitment to challenge uh, established notions and, 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 and wisdom. And also a consistent theme in Barry's work, as I see it, is also a, a refusal to be um, uh, sort of confined within the narrow uh, methodologically nationalist uh, approaches that remain dominant within um, the social sciences, and we might also say within the field of uh, international relations and international political economy. Um, and. Uh, and also Barry's uh, uh, commitment to taking into account the, the structuring effects of um, whether we want to call it the, the world system or, 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 or the international and how these shape the, the very processes of, of development. And I think this again is something that I, I think has stayed with me and, some, uh, and something that I've uh, at least tried to um, apply uh, in my own work. Um, and in my comments, I'd, I'd just like to um, discuss one thing um, which, which um, particularly has, has, has been influential on, on me. So Barry and I both um, shared a, a common interest in the, in, um, the polit political economy of, of East Asia and particularly uh, of the Korean Peninsula. And this, this was a, a prominent uh, aspect of um, Barry's uh, earlier work. Um, so I'd just like to discuss this because, because I think it was um, groundbreaking and, 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 and uh, uh, for me but, but, but also more broadly within studies of East Asian development because of course back in the 1990s you know explaining the rise of East Asia uh, whether it's of Japan or, or the so-called four tigers of South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore um, I mean this this generated a huge amount of debate, not just amongst area specialists, but it, it was a debate about um, development or late development, if you want to call that, call it that more more generally. Okay, so it went beyond the region itself, um, uh, and uh, the context, of course, was also the the rise of neoliberal development economics, particularly in the World Bank, um, which favoured a market oriented understanding of the prerequisites of national development. Um, and then the critique of that approach was put forward by these kind of statist institutionalist people who emphasized the role of, of the state in, in, in facilitating catch-up industrialization, you know, the, the developmental state literature. And, and while that latter 
institutionalist literature seem to have more of a closer correlation with empirical reality, it still left unexplained a number of factors. So, for example, well, where did these institutions actually come from in the first place? And why in East Asia and, and, and not other regions of the non-Western world? Um, and if these statist approaches to development were so effective, then why were they effectively dismantled uh, uh, in the 1990s? And so for Barry, uh, in, in, in some of his earlier publications, um, answering these questions involved, first of all, a critical analysis of the nature of development, but also um, political change, the nature of the democratic transitions that had, had taken place in the region. You know, some of Barry's early publications looked at, um, in particular depth at the case of uh, South Korea and saw how the political transition there uh, had been problematized by uh, the fact that it was uh, synchronous with the ascendance of, of global uh, uh, neoliberalism. Um, but this was not simply a neoliberalism that was imposed from the outside, but um, it was tied up with continuities in, in authoritarian political rule, uh, the growing power of domestic uh, uh, monop monopoly capital. And of course, Barry also took these um, sort of uh, uh, empirical lessons, if you like, further in, in, in sort of reconceptualizing um, the new democracies that, that had uh, emerged from that. So in an article in, in, in the Third World Quarterly, uh, but then later in an edited volume, um, uh, Barry coined the term low intensity democracy. Uh, and that that uh, that edited volume uh, it was co-edited with uh, Joel Rockamora and Richard Wilson, but it had a number of very notable um, contributions by Noam Chomsky, uh, Samir Amin, Andre Gunder Frank, amongst others. And so um, it it showed you know in contrast to more recent popular terms like post-democracy and, and authoritarian neoliberalism, the idea of low intensity democracy um, was um, a, an effort to shed light on the fact that these transitions were kind of compromised from the very outset because of their uh, close alignment with uh, 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 neoliberalism. Um, and also an, just one other aspect of, of Barry's work on East Asia that I wanted to mention was about how it was, um, his analysis was tied up um, with the dynamics of uh, hegemonic and, and world leadership cycles. And uh, I feel I should also mention in the res this respect um, how this shaped uh, the analysis put forward in Barry's first monograph, which was Korea versus Korea, a, a case of uh, contested legitimacy. And as the title suggests, that was an anal analysis of um, the Korean conflict, uh, which, which involved a historically informed exploration of why it was that uh, the South, South Korea, was able to ultimately kind of triumph in terms of economic development and political legitimacy over the North in, in their mutual competition for international standing. And so this involved analyzing how economic um, performance uh, and, and regime adap adaptability to international economic circumstances had, had shaped the, the mixed fortunes of, of, of uh, the, the two halves of the uh, divided uh, Korea. And this was situated in, in, in his broader analysis of, of how the Asian states uh, engaged in uh, industrial modernization in their reaction, um, which has gone on since the 19th century, to uh, Western capitalism. So that's just a kind of um, overview um, of um, Barry's earlier work, which I, I wanted to draw attention to. I'm sure there are many um, speakers today who will be able to unpack uh, other aspects of Barry's later work, but I think you know, a lot of this, these, this kind of, um, these intellectual questions that drove this er early work also um, have their continuities on 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 Barry's later um, kind of rethinking of of um, uh, development. So yes, um, so I, that's that's it for me. Um, but I'd just like to finish um, just by wishing Barry a very uh, uh, happy um, retirement. Um, I mean, I did. 
Barry, I, I didn't actually realize uh, you, you were uh, retiring until I, I received this invitation to, to, to speak. So I'm not sure if this is going to be a, a, a complete retirement from academia or whether it's, um, as it is for many people, um, a, a transition to what you might call indefinite research leave. But whatever your plans are, I, I, I hope your retirement brings you a, a, a well-deserved uh, rest and a chance to, to focus on, on whatever, whatever it is you find uh, uh, meaningful and, and rewarding. And again, um, thank you to the organisers for inviting me uh, to make these comments. It's been a real honour and pleasure. Thank you very much. The, the next uh, contributor to this roundtable uh, in honor of Professor Barry Gills is the, his recent uh, co-author, um, Hamed Hosseini. And uh, Hamed uh, sent a written message and uh, he requested that uh, I read it. Okay. The title is uh, Celebrating the Legacy of uh, Professor Barry K. Gills a journey of transformative scholarship and uh, intellectual reflection um, by S.A. Hamed Hosseini. Um, again, uh, we, uh, we are having some time zone challenge here because his space in Australia, uh, Hamed said. Greetings from the University of Newcastle, Australia. I'm truly excited to be part of this tribute to my good friend and colleague, Professor Barry K. Gills. Barry is not just a distinguished scholar, he's also someone we look up to, a mentor and a friend. I genuinely hope that his retirement will usher in a new and exciting chapter in his intellectual journey, allowing his boundless capabilities to shine even brighter. I am sure we all agree that in today's global context, with challenges aplenty, thinkers like Barry are in high demand. I do wish I could join you in person, but the time zone differences make it a bit tricky. Nevertheless, Please know that I'm here in spirit, enthusiastically celebrating Barry's profound impact on our lives, both academically and professionally, uh, personally. Barry's profound influence extends across the realms of world systems theory, transitional movements, globalization studies, and development studies. His collaborations with outstanding scholars like Andre Gunder Frank and his seminal works like Economics and Climate Emergency, co-edited co alongside uh, Jamie Morgan, have significantly reshaped our comprehension of global economic and environmental dynamics. Moreover, his contributions to People Power in an Era of uh, Global Crisis, co-edited with Kevin Gray, have offered invaluable insights into global resistance and liberation movements. In his role as the editor-in-chief of Globalizations, Barry has been instrumental in cultivating a diverse and critically engaged discourse on globalization. What truly distinguishes Barry is his remarkable ability to seamlessly integrate academic rigor with a heartfelt commitment to addressing pressing global issues. This fusion, fusion of scholarship and genuine concern is strikingly evident across his works, like global development in the Anthropocene. Furthermore, Barry's distinctive approach to critically scrutinizing the impact of neoliberalism on globalization, particularly in edited collections like Globalization in Crisis, 
following the global financial crisis has shed vital light on the intricacies of global capitalism and raised profound concerns related to exploitation and environmental degradation. Barry has tackled key themes in a way that has reshaped our understanding of the world. His exploration of historical globalizations goes beyond a monolithic view, emphasizing its multifaceted nature and advocating for a pluralistic approach to global history. He has also addressed the origins of capital, arguing convincingly for its historical presence over millennia, reshaping our traditional views on economic systems. Barry's research into system dynamics and agency has explored how global systems are shaped by both systemic forces and intentional changes, acknowledging the intricate interplay between structural determinants and individual or collective agency in shaping global phenomena. Perhaps one of Barry's most significant contributions is his concept of a uh, humanocentric global history, fostering a shared global consciousness among people, connecting them through a mutual understanding of their interconnected histories and nurturing a sense of global community. The list of Barry's accomplishments is extensive. And I'm sure there are many, including those who are with us today, who can delve deeper into his seminal works. I want to focus on one of our recent joint works, which I believe captures the essence of Barry's commitment to creating an impactful legacy. In the first chapter of the Routledge Handbook of Transformative Global Studies, published in 2020, Barry and I presented a compelling argument for a transformative approach in development and globalization studies. Our central message stressed the urgent need for a radical transformation of critical scholarship to address the severe crisis facing our planet and civilization. This calls for a comprehensive rethinking of critical theory, moving beyond traditional paradigms and adopting a more holistic, interconnected understanding of global issues. We argued for a scholarship that is existentialist in epistemology, judgmental in axiology, mindful of socio-ecological complexities in analysis, transversalist in intertextual, intercontextual consideration, pragmatist in norms, and dialectical in ontology. I understand this might sound like a mouthful of academic jargon. If you found that intellectually intimidating, don't worry. You are not alone. I invite you to read the paper and our other joint works if you're interested. They're not as complicated as they may sound. In simpler terms, we have made a case about integrating transformative thinking and human agency in scholarship to effectively confront global challenges. Barry's work, including this collaboration, exemplifies a full commitment to transformative scholarship. It goes beyond academic pursuits, advocating for an action-oriented agenda that explores potentials for liberation and alternatives to prevailing paradigms. His career embodies the integration of academic rigor with a profound concern for global issues, fostering academic discourse that encourages diverse and critical perspectives on globalization. His commitment was not just confined to his publications, but also deeply embedded in his lived 
practices which many of us have encountered in our interactions with him. Now, let me share a transcript of a short speech given by Barry when he joined the University of Helsinki in the summer of 2013. I had the privilege of visiting him in person for the first time during my sabbatical in Helsinki. And I vividly remember this tradition where newly appointed academics were taken on a city tour by Professor Teivo Teivainen. Professors were expected to deliver a brief speech on the purpose of the university. I hope the tradition is still alive there. I recorded Barry's speech and uploaded it to YouTube. For those interested in watching, you may search for, I quote, the purpose of the university by Professor Barry Gills, 2013 Helsinki. Barry's definition of the university's purpose, which I have transcribed with some minor proofreading to address voice clarity issues, goes as follows, and I quote, the purpose of the university, as Barry says, is to preserve and perpetuate the life of intellectual reflection. To achieve this, the university must enjoy complete freedom of thought and inquiry. It stands as the most precious and vital institution in our culture and civilization. Education the pursuit of knowledge, the expansion of the mind, and the deepening of our understanding of life with regard to its value to us and our social existence cannot be quantified and should never be commodified. The entire history of intellectual thought might be said to begin with skepticism and critical questioning that challenge accepted knowledge mythology, religion, hierarchy, the state, absolutism, and tyranny. It revolves around the question of the mind and the pursuit of what we do not know yet. The fact of critical questioning and challenging those in authority or those who claim such authority is fundamental to the life and purpose of the university. Barry then ended his speech by saying, and I quote, I hope that you will join me in making a lifelong commitment to this principle with all your heart, soul, and mind. Let us embrace the life of intellectual reflection and stand firm against those who would impose tyranny over the freedom of thought. In closing, allow me to echo Barry's visionary words and extend his call to action. I earnestly hope that each of us will make a lifelong commitment to this principle with our whole hearts, souls, and minds. Together, let us embrace the life of intellectual reflection and stand united against any forces that attempt to curtail the autonomy of transformative inquiry. I am deeply thankful for the honor and for her presence and participation in this celebration of Professor Barry K. Gill's remarkable legacy. Let us carry forward his passion for transformative scholarship and commitment to intellectual reflection as we navigate the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Yes. Thank you, uh, Hamed. Um, we will invite a couple of uh, comments from the room shortly. But in the meanwhile, uh, we have two of our colleagues who would like to make some reflections. Uh, first, Professor Anya Newgren.
Good morning for everyone. In addition to what has already been said, I want to say a few words about Barry as my very near academic colleague since 2013, when Barry started uh, as Professor of Global Development Studies here at the University of Helsinki. And about Barry's role as a founding member of EXALT, the Global Extractivisms and Alternatives Initiative here at the University of Helsinki. This initiative started for some five, six years ago with the idea of developing new theoretical and methodological approaches to global extractivisms understood as overextensions of resource e exploitation and transformative alternatives for building more just and sustainable futures. In 2020, we applied for a center of excellence for global extractivisms and alternatives in the Academy of Finland or current Finnish Research Council Hall. In addition to Professor Barry Gills, the team of the PIs included Professors Maria Enström Fuentes, Markus Gröder, Franklin Oben Odom, Teivo Teivainen, and me. Our proposal was shortlisted but not funded. Barry's contribution to the COE proposal was extraordinary, always very encouraging and looking, looking forward, highly inspiring and with cutting edge ideas. The idea in the COE was to analyze the political, economic, political, ecological, and post-colonial aspects of extractivisms and their linkages to climate change and environmental social responsibility in various parts of the world. The key idea in the research that Barry was planning to lead as PI was to link the variegated forms of extraction to global politics and concurrent crises and transformative alternatives, including climate emergencies, authoritarian regimes, but, but also politics of resistance and alternative imaginings. One of the core ideas of Barry was also to develop the concept of global extractivism into a into an analytical device to link sector, sectoral analysis of different forms of extractivism with insights on their relations to, to sustainability and responsibility. Crucial in the context of contemporary insecurities, disasters and crises, as we heard in, in Paris keynote lecture. The research on global extractivisms and transformative alternatives, where Barry has been one of the found foundational leaders, goes forward and will surely continue in the future. Several research projects have been funded by the Finnish Research Council and by the Kone Foundation for research on agro extractivism, hydrocarbon extractivism, mining, tree plantations, authoritarian regimes, and politics of res resistance, etc. These projects incorporate many outst outstanding PhD researchers, postdoctoral researchers, university researchers, and academic fellows in GDS and other social sciences and environmental social sciences. The GDS at the University of Helsinki, as a research community, is highly linked to analyzing extractivism, global, global crisis, environmental justice, authoritarian regimes, alternative, alternative knowledges, 
all of these key areas of various research interests. The conference of the Finnish Society of Development Research has many interesting keynotes and sessions on these topics and will surely have in the future. Various contribution to the Finnish Society for Develop Development Research has been excellent. Let me say a few words of Barry as an academic leader, as a teacher, and as a supervisor, and as a co-supervisor. Uh, Barry and me have co-supervised four PhDs. Two of them already completed. Anna Salmivara on uh, uh, struggles of trade unions in textile industry uh, in Cambodia, and Saila Maria Saristo on housing uh, occupations in Lisbon, Portugal. Then two of them are in progress. Anti Parvinen's thesis on innovation economy in Israel uh, and Palestine and intersections of colonization and innovation. And then Ville Ikavalko on political ecology of air pollution in India and Bangladesh. Barry also re received an award of best international teacher at the University of Helsinki. I just want to mention some of the many skills of Barry as a supervisor and advisor. First, Barry's uh, uh, methodological encouragement for rigid conceptualization. Second, his engagement and encouragement for well thought scholar activism. Third, Barry's wide understanding of values of different approaches and methodologies. And fourth, his skills on focusing of his skills of focusing on advising the academic work, not the researcher as a person. Barry's legacies to the future of, of development studies and development research for new academic leaders and young scholars, both here in Finland and abroad, are enormous. Then, something about the everyday academic life. Barry and me, we have evaluated hundreds of research proposals, student, students' applications uh, for PhD study rights, and applications for academic post, posts together. Although we come from fairly different academic backgrounds, me from political economy, environmental anthropology, and critical resource geography, Barry as an international political economist and a well-known scholar in world systems, and globalization. Still, we have had uh, always fairly similar views of the excellent applications and excellent thesis. So it has been somehow comfortable to make difficult decisions with you. During these years, we have also gone through many challenges, including a huge university reform, moving as an academic community from one building to another, drastic reductions of research funding, but still he survived. Um, in fact, I think that we, with you, Barry, we never had a quarrel or even a strong disagreement between us during these more than 10 years of being near colleagues. I highly appre appreciate your great academic leadership, 
your encouragement and your support. I want to finish by using three mottos or slogans which Barry has used for several times during our common academic journey, journey in different occasions. Putting them all together gives us a very inspiring spiral advice of where to focus our energies as academics in the future. So, the three slogans. First, thinking is writing. Second, writing is working. And third, working is thinking. Thank you so much, Barry. It has been really nice to be your new colleague. And I look forward for many, many more years to have you as a colleague. Probably with more time for thinking, writing, and working in the aspects that you think are the most crucial ones. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ten, ten years without quarrels? Well, how could you do that? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> finally, um, uh, <laughs> that's a high standard. Um, um, uh, our dear colleague um, and, and fellow urban and regional political economist, trying to uh, type it in, please. Thank you. Yeah, it's an um, honor to be here. And I think we can all recognize the emotional atmosphere here that um, Barry has um, touched many of us and been able to uh, build communities um, and influence us not only as um, thinkers, but as human beings. So I started writing yesterday what I want to say, and it turned into a sort of a kind of a horrible um, melodramatic soap opera of confession. So that's not what I'm going to do here. But... I'm going to show you something from my experience um, working, being supervised by Barry, uh, being his courses um, for quite many years, ever since doing the MA uh, here in development studies, and then maybe come to this very present moment uh, at the end. Um, so Barry, as a supervisor, as a teacher, um, that's the kind of role that often uh, is becomes invisible for, except for those who are very students and supervisor, uh, PhD students, and uh, uh, conduct their work under him. So it, that's why it's important to share his experiences. So um, what convinced me, part big part of what convinced me to be in academia also was the way Barry supervised during my MA thesis, which is a method of freedom. Um, he shows you, sorry for the dusty metaphor, but he's a living library. Uh, he shows you hallways <clears throat> to enter, books to read. Um, but doesn't tell you what to find or the result. This is part of the whole philosophy of non-determinism that you heard about um, earlier. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I remember one beautiful Experience straight off from when I started doing PhD, we went to London and we visited beautiful libraries there, um, especially the one in Walbrook Institute. Uh, I encourage you all to familiarize yourself with the way that libraries organized, uh, very unconventionally, like Barry's library, uh, too. Um, second, on the kind of a legacy, and I'm only touching one aspect of it that uh, Barry is leaving to Helsinki um, through his teaching is to think the global as a method and not simply as a kind of a, a clearly cut sequence, a period in history, but as a as a realm of curiosity, as a um, way of looking at the connections uh, and way of resisting those 
um, clear-cut storylines and separated entity entities, whether spatially or temporally, that seem to um, um, reject, uh, d d deny our thinking in many in many ways. To see the connections even within the the seemingly isolated and enclosed origin points to always look for them and and i think that's uh it's the most difficult thing to do uh uh to remember that um finally something an element of, of barry's work that hasn't been so much discussed yet and about how Barry's thinking also what I think Anya referred when you talked about reimagination and, and images. What I've enjoyed a lot, uh, endless discussions with Barry is about thinking myth, taking myth seriously, taking image seriously, not simply as a false uh, consciousness or a, um, kind of a, a, a idealistic phenomena that can be simply uh, thrown away, but really think myth seriously. The, 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 the meaning it brings that is often violent as well. And here I'm alluding to, in the spirit of the um, um, activist scholar uh, that Barry also is to the ongoing events in Gaza, and the way in which what is dropped on Palestinians is not simply bombs but also genocidal myths that are part of the long history uh, of a myth of civilization. You think of, you can think about what uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, early on in October. This is a war between um, laws of jungle and humanity. This is a war between children of light and children of darkness. And you can easily see where Palestinians were thrown at, to the dark jungle. And this is not specific to Israel. This is a part of a long cooking uh, myth of uh, capitalist modernity. And to really see beyond that history is, is, is what Barry has been able to uh, help us with, to see beyond that kind of storylines. And I think one thinker that is helpful here is also um, someone that I found through the hallways uh, that Perry pointed me towards is Walter Benjamin, who says that the state lives on a myth of repetition, on a myth of re eternal recurrence. These stories, the good and the bad, and the light and the dark, the jungle and the civilization, they just keep on returning. And I think this very moment... Uh, is the kind of a moment where this kind of geopolitics of uh, banality, of idiocy, of, of kind of macabre myths are returning. And they are myths that keeps the time still. And it's a very violent way of keeping the time still. So as a, in a way of going forwards together with Barry, um, I hope our um, exchange will continue through many years to come and um, towards breaking the standstill that is here. Thanks. Many thanks, uh, Anya and uh, and Auntie. Um, we have heard just how engaging Professor Gills has been as a teacher and as a scholar, and as a colleague, as a mentor. Um, as a friend, as an activist, oh, how awful and oxymoronic it would be for us to leave here without engaging members of this audience. So at this point, uh, may we open the floor for a couple of quick observations uh, and comments, just a couple. Yes, Sana. <laughs> Is this working? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not a question or 
really a comment, but rather just a thank you to Barry. I think, I don't know, I, I came to Global Development Studies 10 years ago and really found a home. And it's it's very much uh, due to what you've done to the discipline and how what kind of atmosphere uh, you fostered and, and created. And yeah, I think one of the things that I've tried to kind of take from you into guiding my own own research and kind of thinking is your just this amazing way of being radical and sharp in thinking while always being gentle as well and having this structural global approach as a method in a way but always have the human at the center of that that none of this becomes this kind of conceptual intellectual game but it's always about us and humans and humanity and and life in general and i and i really want to thank you for that and you've done an, an amazing job thank you for the home that you've created at gds any any are there any further comments Words of thanks, appreciation. Yes, just one more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just a brief moment, as I am actually one that has been kind of thrust into the whole GDS sphere in, in my first year of, of the University of Helsinki without actually knowing that I would turn out to be a GDS scholar uh, misplacing it in the Faculty of Arts and then just generally uh, reaching out more and more to international political economy. Of course, you unavoidably are going to stumble into someone who has met um, Barry Kegels at some point in their lives. And I just think it's it's really um, fascinating how you would just, you know, in your work, be talking to trade union activists in Brazil who are critical of, of bilaterals and of free trade agreements and then you mentioned you work in Helsinki and I was like, okay, then you must know Barry Kegels and send him my best regards when I was talking to Gonzalo Beron, um, Argentinian activist, uh, very uh, present in Brazilian scholarship, but also, of course, um, uh, trade unionist. And then since the beginning of the common market of the South has been their critical presence, also aiding, of course, in the in the peasant movement. And it's, of course, Barry is eventually going to come up. So it's it's very interesting to be thrust into uh, into the world of IP and into Barry's world without even actually being personally acquainted with Barry yet. So it's yeah, it's quite the 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 honor to be now part of this GDS circle and of course hopefully getting to know more of Barry's work even you know as he um, goes into retirement. Thank you. Oh, this just one more, okay. what, 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 the last one, and then I will invite Professor Gills to make a few observations before we we conclude the session. Uh, so you may. Yeah, probably I'm pretty new um, to GDS and also uh, faculty of social science here. Um, I, I want to um, express my sincere uh, thanks for Professor Barry Gills because he has opened the door for me when I had the most darkest moment in life. And he <clears throat> accepted me as a doctor researcher under his supervi supervision, mm -hmm. even um, he about to retire. So I was sincerely um, feel like somebody in this world can, can really give you hope. Every time we exchange emails, we're probably not seeing each other so much, but I can always feel the spirit and strength from you. And it's guided me how, how I can be a better human, um, to care about human in the society in my lifetime. So I thank you so much for, for um, still uh, helping young people like me. And I hope um, uh, all of us will remind, remember you in the lifetime the way I did. Thank you. Um, with these um, observation, words of thanks, um, comments. I will invite Professor Gills uh, to say just a few words, uh, both um, 
in response to uh, um, the members of the panel and comment and um, to uh, comments from uh, from the floor. Yes. Brief, only briefly. <laughs> anything that's funny no. <laughs> okay that's uh, not possible uh, it looks like i'm not really retiring i'm, I'm just pretending <laughs> and Tavo said that I'm, you're just pretending to be retiring it i suppose that's the way it goes um it's just a phase uh yes what did don say the, uh, congratulations on entering your permanent research leave yes hope so. Um, one th so many wonderful things were said, and I'm deeply moved and I'm embarrassed. And um, one thing I think it was very important um, that's, that's under, it uh, at, at, at actually has motivated me since the 1970s, when I started voraciously reading on the origins of civilization, the origins of the state, the origins of class society, and read everything I could find in anthropology, archaeology, history, is that I concluded and I maintain to now why I worked on world system theory, globalization, is because I absolutely am sure that humanity is one. We, we are we, we are humanity, we are the people, we are one, and therefore our history is one. It's the history of humanity. And as my friend Jamie was trying to point out, I was trying to avoid doom and gloom. I think Kevin once said at a, at a, at a, at a, a meeting we had somewhere, India, De New Delhi, someplace, um, he said that I've never heard Barry give a talk when it didn't end or sound like doom and gloom <laughs> was, was, was approaching, was imminent. <laughs> so I wanted to avoid that today because there's plenty of that <clears throat> in the room. But, um, you know, I had, uh, the, the re I had thought that the unity of consciousness through, through reconstructing a revisionist global history, which was humanocentric, not Anglo-centric, not Eurocentric, not Sinocentric, not Indocentric, not Afrocentric, but humanocentric. It's a history of one people, despite all the illusions of separations. It's a history that William H. McNeil called a history of mutuality. And through that, you, you would hope for or hope to encourage by establishing that as truth and documenting it. You would see that we, we form a, 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 a new consciousness and that that consciousness is our hope because we have also one fate. And we do face uh, now an extraordinary existential crisis. Uh, so I, I don't want to say more about that because it, it's a bummer. Uh, so I give, but, but it's the truth. So that you see now my my the madness and my logic is uh, whatever you want to call it and uh, is that through establishing the unity of humanity absolutely as one and one people with one history and then one future some that changes things and all this madness of nationalism and compartmentalization and fragmentation and rivalry and war and killing and right, madness it's madness. And so we, you know, uh, we're born with a house on fire. And as Jamie said, if you're born into a house on fire, you, you, you don't, you don't, you know, your, your task is to put it out. Put out the fire. You know, and that's uh, what I hope we're doing. And uh, it's now or never. <laughs> so it's, my my deep heartfelt thought, thanks to absolutely everyone, and to, um, I give you my there's there's in Geordie, the northeast of England where I've lived so many decades, uh, but uh, now it's time for us to part, and I hope that we will meet again. Uh, we've spent the day, 
uh, and there's nought that I can bid you, but that peace and love can with you. <laughs> um, in concluding this session, it must be noted just how moving and for me how informative and inspiring this session has been. I too have been uh, a beneficiary of Professor Gill's uh, insight, uh, support and mentoring, especially during my greatest time of uncertainty, tenure track associate uh, professor. Well, I am now tenured, so <laughs> that's proof of uh, Barry's great strategic advice, suggestions uh, and guidance levels of support that make the him amazing grace i once was blind but now i can see make more sense professor gills started his professorship in 2013 pointing to crisis especially related to unsustainability and how certain global approaches are needed to address these questions around 2017 he identified what he called quote, new extractivist mode uh, of economic development as a major obstacle to progress. From then to now, he has been looking for alternatives to this model, even attempting to redefine uh, capital, the title of his latest co-authored book. Professor Gill's lecture today our panelists' brilliant contributions, your excellent questions, comments, statements of praise, bring us closer to the truth. The criticisms I highlighted earlier in my introduction of Professor Gales become easy to handle. Did Gales become too ecological? The answer is an emphatic no. His inaugural lecture signaled that agenda. So if critics say he is, he is too ecological, well, that is simply proof that Professor Gills has done precisely what he promised to do. The Helsinki tradition of global development studies emphasizes relevance over reverence for traditions. For Gills, development must be understood as remaking the world, from global crisis to global convergence. A continuing challenge, no doubt, but as uh, Professor Gills shortly retires from his position, he leaves us with the following words, uh, stated boldly in today's lecture, but also in one of his papers uh, in the Forum for Development Studies, from which I borrow liberally and quote loosely. I have written so much about crisis, the most common keyword in my life's words. It is important that hope for a positive future be kept alive, for it is by hope and by optimism of the will that the world will most surely be transformed for the betterment of all. Thank you very much, Professor Gios. Thank you. Thank you.